uh, of all things to consider here, maybe one of the most important is life cycle planning. That's the phrase that Jeff gave me a month or so ago when we were considering what to do today. You know, some will drive a car or truck for 10 or 15 years. Uh, a friend of mine just bought a diesel that he says he expects it to run for a million miles before it has a problem. Uh, my sister, she's in a 2000 Toyota, and I cringe every time I, I see her. It's not an antique, but getting close in at 22 years, I don't know how much longer is that going to last. But what about transmitters, antennas, consoles, codecs? Uh, what else? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about here. And uh, one of the things that we want to talk about is lifestyle, our life cycle when things happen. And let's face it, some of us are going to retire. Some of us are going to get hit by a truck. And that file with all the passwords, what's going to happen there? If somebody comes in and has to access it, and they don't know how to get hold of you, especially if you're six feet under or in a box. Jeff, well, where do you, you want to start? <laughs> well, you really took a dark turn with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, happy new year to you too. Um, <laughs> let's see, I, I, I don't know how to follow that opener. Um, the, the big thing, and we've, we've touched on this, I think last month we were talking a segue to, but uh, the big thing's having an inventory because you know you can't start even figuring life cycle until you know what you've got. And some stuff is going to have, you know, like, I mean, I've got an EV635 in a drawer around here that uh, my older boy used when he was a teenager. And I came down here one night, heard some clang that didn't sound like cowbell. And he was uh, swinging that mic at the end of the cord and beating it against the steel support bowl, pole in the ceiling. And, of course, it's an EV635. It sounds the same now as it did before the day it came out of the box. Not necessarily good, just the same. Um, and, and so that, uh, you know, that, that mic might have a little longer life cycle replacement, but it, it's funny cause you, you made the little slip there with lifestyle versus life cycle and the two tie totally together because, you know, the, the lifestyle that your equipment lives will determine what its life cycle is. If it runs hot, it's going to live less. If it, um, you know, stays pretty cool and calm and collected, it, it may live a little longer. So, uh. Yeah, so that, the reasons we tell people to make sure their transmitter buildings are properly air conditioned or air handled, whether it's whether it's circulating air, air conditioning, heat pumps. I'm, I'm pretty flexible about this stuff, but yeah, yeah. Uh, cool, clean, and well grounded. You know, if you cover the three of them, then uh, you're going to be pretty well off. Um, so yeah, but I would figure transmitter wise these days, especially as we get more and more into dealing with supply chain and, uh, inventory stream issues. And I mean, used to be, if I built a new design in the eighties, I could be pretty sure I could find a TL082 for the next couple of decades. As a matter of fact, I can still find two TL082s. Um, finding an EE prom from 15, 16 years ago, that could be a bigger challenge. Now, a lot of us manufacturing wise will, will sub stuff like that out. Some will, some won't. So you definitely need to know what you've got and, uh, whether that OEM will still support it. Um, Jeff Adams makes a good comment. Will an SSD last as long as a, a spinning hard drive? And at the moment, all data points to yes, but again, depends on the environment. A solid state drive will tend to be a little more susceptible to, to some of the slings and arrows of uh, outrageous misfortune, so to speak. So, uh, yep, <laughs> there, there's one. Got no money to take care of it. Remember, I'm in broadcasting. <laughs> Yup, that also applies um, because the budget factors into this as well. You know, I mean, it's all, I, I guess, a juggling act. But what do they say? Um, there's almost never, what, everything gets done when you've got time and you've got money. The challenge is finding both at the same time. 
And uh, th that's kind of, you know, something we got to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, quite true. And uh, I, I, sorry for you folks on, on YouTube, you won't be able to participate, but I'm I'm throwing up a, a little poll, anonymous poll. It doesn't know who you are or will know who you are, but just, you know, what your uh, feelings are about your transmitter. We'll ask today, how old is your transmitter? And uh, what your feelings are about its potential replacement? And I just, like I say, just like to see what you think about that. And uh, it's uh, it, it's just up there. And hey, so for number four, you made it a multiple choice question with yes or no as the answer. <laughs> well, hmm. <laughs> I'm going to put yes anyway. Um, okay. And, and I mean, I've got the, uh, the what do you call it, um, dubious advantage uh, playing both on the manufacturing side and on the uh, customer side. So, uh, yeah, I mean, perfect example. We've got a VS1 at our community station. It did a couple of years of duty at, as a demo transmitter, it did a couple more years of duty as a periodic use transmitter for a seasonal license, which you can't get uh, event licensing in Canada. That's a, a unique to us. And uh, now it's since August 2016, it's been putting in 1,400 watts into a two-bay antenna on top of the hill. So it's pushing ballpark about 11 years old, and we're starting to look at, uh, at what we're going to do for it. And, and again, our goal is to have it replaced while it's still in pretty good shape, because then we've got a backup, which we don't have at the moment. And Elaine was just talking to somebody who retired their 35-year-old Amphet 10. Um, was that Soldatna, Elaine? KSLD? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, yeah, I mean, there are still people. Yeah, there, there are still fewer than going. And I mean, that's the other thing, you know, again, cool, clean, well grounded, uh, sort of like what uh, Ken was saying that George Marty used to say. And I've been kind of adopting that. But uh, if you can do that, it's going to live a whole lot longer. Now, we do know that Nautella has a reputation. And I'll and I'll and I'll say this so Jeff doesn't have to for supporting everything they've ever sold. So mm -hmm. that, uh, if you have an Amphet and it's 25 years old or even older, uh, you can get parts and support for it. It may not be the cheapest bunch of parts and support in the world, but you can keep that transmitter rolling, and it's important because. One of the questions I didn't get to, and I should have put in there, and maybe I will the next time, uh, is it a budget issue? What about, does your manager refuse to upgrade or replace a transmitter? Because mm -hmm. it's interesting, our biggest uh, our biggest group right now is transmitters over 20 years. Oh, usually. You know, I mean, I would guess that there are still a lot well, I mean, I ran into a BT5F that was still full-time service not too long ago. Did you hurt yourself when you ran into it? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, but I, yeah, I, 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 I set them up and knocked them down. I, I would not have. I would not have expected the majority. So far, we've had about half of the folks with us uh, participate in the poll. Uh, I would not have expected uh, to see over 20 years to be the the winner so far. Hey, Barry. Yes, sir. Well, we uh, we had a BEHD transmitter, which was fine. It had some issues, but it was mostly mostly okay. Mm -hmm. But we replaced it well before it's. It was like it was eight years old when we replaced it with a with one of Jeff's brands because. Uh, just because of the electricity savings, the the payout in electric and air conditioning savings was three years for, for the yeah. same TPO and everything. Well, and that can be if you're especially if you're looking at like a, a low power or high power with an injector and you got the injector losses. And, yeah, uh, all that stuff. 
there were a few of them where they even put the reject loads inside instead of outside, and uh, that that carries its own special brand of uh, challenge. It, yeah, it has. Well, it had challenges with the uh, with the IPA with the PA modules. You mm -hmm. could you could run that. There's another transmitter of its same build running just analog. Works yeah. great. This one would drop PA modules about twice a year, mm -hmm. and we couldn't figure out. And they couldn't figure it out either. Just something. Something with running, you know, with having pushing everything to the edge in that was design. It running, uh, was it a hybrid system? Yeah. You said? Yeah. And I mean, that, uh, be fair about it, that was one of the challenges with linearizing some designs. They work great as analog solid state boxes running class CE or, or class D modulation. And uh, when they, or class D amplification, and, and when they, um, got converted to being linear, some vets, some devices are a little less happy about being run in that in-between yeah. mode. Yeah, that's kind of what we concluded. But, you know, but the point was, it, you know, the budget was there and, and we were able to justify it by saying, well, it's three years, we break even. And after that, we make money, you know, yeah. compared. And yeah. that's true. And, and the numbers have proven that to be correct. Right. And I um, mean, Jeff Adams has got a comment here about VS two and a half, I'm assuming uh, PA died in June. Now another one, same age. So the other ones will go as well soon. And that's a, a maybe um, if they're failing because of transient issues, maybe they will, maybe they won't. If they're failing because of environmental issues, then yeah, they're all going to go in about the same time frame. Um, I don't have a, a projected life expectancy. I mean, again, I'm running one of the very first VS transmitters and we've had one power supply failure in 11 years. So, you know, it, it is going to vary a lot. Now, I, I've got the dubious honor or advantage that uh, my gear is afraid to fail because it knows I'll touch it if it does. And uh, that makes a difference, I think. Well, one of the things that is worth commenting on, I guess, and and that is, is as these transmitters get older, um, you already mentioned, I think, the efficiency. And I saw mm -hmm. a news report last night that in some markets, electricity has gone up almost by 50% this year. Our local utility is petitioned to increase the cost of power by 100% over the next eight years. So, yeah. Wow. And I mean, it's, you know, this is, is it, it's a known thing, so it's not a surprise, but it, it's still an added operational cost. Now, fortunately for us, we're a low power, I mean, 1400 watts, you know, the, the difference between double on that power bill is 50, 60 bucks a month. So it, it's not as critical as if I was running a, a class C. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's something you need to factor in as well. There are going to be times, and I mean, I give you one example. I was talking to a guy the other day. He was uh, starting to price an AM. And, and I've told this story before, a different version of it, because I've had this conversation a couple of hundred times in the past 15, 20 years. But uh, he's running, he's still running an old uh, tube type AM. And I don't remember what model, and it really doesn't matter. But on a good day with fresh tubes, he might be getting 50% overall efficiency. And at 10 kilowatts out, that's a lot of power consumption. And in his particular area, they're paying 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So, I mean, that's a four-year payback when you go to the almost 90% overall efficiency on a new box. And that's before you turn the MDCL on and drop your power consumption another 25%. So, you know, in his case, he's like, he's got sticker shock with the big purchase price. And, and I get it, it's a, lot, a big number, but if you do the math on it, I mean, you paid a loan for four years out of the power savings almost, and then you uh, are, are banking money. Now, Jeff, the uh, MDCL business, the mm -hmm. uh, power saving, will this apply to all Nautel transmitters? Any of our current AMs except the J1000. Okay. Now, for older ones, uh, like if you've got an XL, XR, or ND series, we can upgrade it to do MDCL. Um, now, the ND series, you're starting to get the upgrade is a little cost prohibitive. I don't know if I'd bother, but for an XL or an XR, it's five or six grand, give or take. And, so and again, let's go to the ND now as an example. Yeah. To replace that transmitter as opposed to upgrading to MDCL. 
Mm -hmm. All Is right, so if you sense? take an ND10, just an example, 10 kilowatt, because you get much below like five kilowatts and less, you're not really saving enough with MDCL to make it worth doing it as its own thing. But uh, if you look at a 10 kilowatt as an example, so you're talking a transmitter that we stopped building in 1995, 96. So pushing 30 years old anyway. The upgrade is going to be in the ballpark of $20,000. New transmitter is probably going to be closer to 50. And I'm just making numbers up here. I haven't looked them up. But, uh, you know, it, it is a bigger jump. Now, the difference is MDCL on an ND10 will drop your power bill about 25% total. Switching that ND10 with 75% efficiency to an NX10 with uh, 90% and then dropping the MDCL onto that, it's going to drop your power bill by 40 to 45%. So, again, you know, you, you're going to see almost double the savings with uh, and, and that's two solid state transmitters that doesn't even look at tubes. Well, that's so, what we're talking about with life cycle yeah. planning. Right. So just because you have a just because you have an operating transmitter and God forbid the station owner says, well, solid state, you don't ever have to replace anything. Yes, you do. It's still cost of operation. I mean, you know, and, and just to, to to really light a political fuse, look at uh, electric cars, EVs. I mean, the, the very first ones out there, I'm not 100% sure you could sell me one of those on the used market, but I'd consider a new one. Um, and over the next 10 years, hopefully as fuel cell or battery technology improves, they'll become more of a, you know, a better again. But it, it's all coming back to the same deal. I mean, we continually improve designs. Otherwise, there'd be no point in making a new design. You know, I mean, we had this discussion, actually, uh, one of our marketing guys who will remain nameless, but Elaine's just going to start rolling her eyes and nodding her head shortly, um, uh, suggested a re-releasing an existing product and basically just giving it a facelift. He just wanted to change a few feet. And I said, what the hell's the point? You're not improving anything. You're just making it prettier. I mean, it's, you know, I, I may have used the lipstick on a pig analogy, which uh, didn't really apply because the original transmitter was pretty good. But, but again, you know, unless there's a significant benefit to be realized either in, on, on the manufacturing end and cost of operation or, or cost of production or on the user end with uh, benefits, features or whatever, then it's hard to justify. That's the reason our, one kilowatt, for example, the J1000 design is pushing 25 years old now. And I mean, we, it's hard to justify the investment in rebuilding it. Eventually, we probably will. But uh, but yeah, I mean, same with the life cycle. You know, if you're replacing it for the purpose of features or cost of operation, cost of operation, you can quantify. Features, you got to look at the value to you. So and that's whether you're talking automation or, uh, <laughs> yeah, Elaine rolled her eyes big time. Exactly. <laughs> but um, automation systems, as an example, I mean, an old uh, Audio Arts uh, A1A, or I, I forget the model number, the R20, I think, was the one that we used to run. I mean, as long as you can get the, the faders and the jocks don't drop any uh, Pepsis or coffees into it, those things pretty much mostly run. You know, now at some point, having a nice digital control surface would be pretty slick. For us in our particular application where we run mostly remote and uh, only do our uh, our production with uh, live, live uh, people in the studio, a, a few people come in to do their shows live just for the uh, curb appeal because we've got a big window face of Main Street. But, uh, but yeah, for us to invest a lot of money in replacing our boards right now, probably not going to happen. There, there's just not a performance improvement aspect. Give us another five or 10 years when we can't get parts for the ones we've got. And then, yeah, it'll be a different uh, different scenario. And hopefully we'll make the decision before we get there. Sure. One of the uh, folks on uh, YouTube uh, mentions their transfer is 30 years old at SX5. Yep. Now, so I've got my own opinion about the A-series SXs, and I'll keep that to myself. But, uh, 
again, it, it's one of those situations. I mean, if you look like Mike Patton's done with the SX series with the with those uh, cool little um, little touchscreen. I don't know if it's touchscreen, but the little uh, OLED uh, displays that he's got. I mean, there's still some support available for that stuff. You're probably not going to get as much from the factory as you could then, although I'm pretty sure you could still reach Walter and uh, get an answer to a question. So, yeah, you, you kind of look at it based on, again, need, reliability. You were talking about the 2000 Toyota. I mean, if you can still get parts for it and you're keeping it well-maintained and it's getting you down the road and starts every time, then why not? You know, for me, we've got two vehicles in the yard. My wife's car <laughs> is the 2013 that's a, getting a little long in the tooth. But, again, it starts when she needs it and goes where she needs it to. And then my pickup truck will basically be run until it disintegrates, and then we'll buy a new one. Uh-huh. Now, it's I'll, a Chev, so that won't take too long, but that's a whole different discussion. I'll, I'll, leave, the, um, I'll leave the poll up a little bit longer. If you haven't had a chance to pop up there and tell us how old your transmitter is or what your plan is, please do. Yeah. Just just a straw poll, no names. Nobody's going to get a phone call. Well, I might get a call, phone call from Jeff, but it no. really good. And I don't do the phone. If I can avoid it, I'll send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, it comes back to what I started with. Uh, you really need to have an asset inventory because if you know what you've got and how old it is and what shape it's in, then you can sort of start figuring about how long you can figure to get from it before it starts to, again, like like I said with my pickup, disintegrate. I mean, I keep an eye that the Chevs, one thing that you notice with the Chev trucks up here is that the frames start to rot after X number of years. So I keep an eye on that. And I mean, I do undercoat it too, but, uh, but yeah, you, you just, if you're paying attention to that sort of thing, then you can schedule your replacement before the main goes down. And I, I mean, my dad used to undercoat his cars, but that was mm -hmm. when we lived in New Jersey and out here, we don't do that. Anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, how much ice do you get in your neck of the woods? It's not uh, permitted. It's by law, no <laughs> snow in air in Tucson. I had a friend let's, driving from let's North go Dakota. Back to the... to... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Go back to the transfer for just a moment, if if you don't mind. And yeah, if if you're not going to replace if you're not going to replace the transmitter, mm -hmm. there are things that need to be done. You were mentioning the grounding, uh, you were mentioning uh, the, the other air handling, and that yep. includes filters. Right. Yep. I mean, if you're the 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 challenge I've got is that a lot of us think back to the days when you could just shove the transmitter in a corner and let it run. And every couple of years, somebody would go in. Well, of course, a lot of us go back to the thinking, talking about the old tube days. Yeah, they just sat there and ran. And they sat there and ran, but typically you had two transmitter engineers on staff plus a couple of studio engineers instead of one guy handling eight stations in three states. So that's changed a lot. Um, you know, there, there are things that the old rigs, they handle if you lost a, an exhaust fan, although if your uh, airflow switch went down, assuming the interlock wasn't bypassed, then that would take you out. So, and I've run into a few bypassed airflow interlocks, I ran into one where it pretty much melted everything right down into the power supply. So, yeah, I mean... You know, I'm not talking about those ones because those ones are the ones where we're going to get a call someday. Hey, we're off the air. Everything melted. How fast can you get us a new transmitter? And after the hysterical laughter stops, we'll say, well, you better start looking at your alternative solutions. You know, can you get a one kilowatt and slap it into an end connector to three and an eighth adapter to get you on the air for the next, I don't know, several months? So, and that comes back, remember, we had a uh, supply chain conversation mm -hmm. oh, a while back. And uh, it, that's one of the challenges. I mean, Wilson and I got our uh, little, uh, little we, we get a weekly, quote unquote weekly, um, we get a periodic report on how long things are taken to go through production from order to shipping. And that number's been pretty consistent at uh, 16 to 20 weeks. So 
you know, if you call me today and tell me that you are off the air and you need a transmitter tomorrow, you're probably not going to get a high power or full power one. You know, you might get, you know, I might grab Jeff's uh, loaner or his demo of VX300 or something. We'll steal something, but, uh, but yeah, you're not, you're not getting a 40 or 30 kilowatt transmitter overnighted or even next week. So that, that's uh, something that we need to plan for more than we ever did before. Um, hopefully that'll change, but I'm not seeing it from the reports that are hitting my desk. How are HD uh, oriented transmitter sales uh, coming? I know the new VX is uh, HD uh, version, uh, no, no HD. No, the the new HD uh, the VX is HD free. That that's my uh, that that's my description. Uh, they're talking about possibly adding it as a second generation upgrade to the high power ones, but I wouldn't bet my paycheck on it until I actually saw it going out the door. Um, so, but overall, when you get above the five kilowatt mark, I think HD makes up about 20 to 25% of overall, had a rough guess. Wilson, is that about right? He, he's nodding and making the up sound. So, uh, yeah, in that range. So it, it's, you know, it, it's not the majority, I don't think, but it's it's a significant quantity. Can you yep. quantify just out of curiosity? Is it slowing mm -hmm. down right now, staying s steady in terms of sales, or or becoming more popular? I'd say it's pretty steady. The thing that is picked up more is people that are doing upgrades are hedging their bets a little and saying, "Look, I don't want HD right now, but I want to know that I can do it." Mm -hmm. um, that that's got a little bit of an uptick, especially when you get into the class B's and higher. Um, when you're down in class A territory and, and the low power stuff, a little less. I mean, folks know what their market's like, you know, and I mean, like where I live, for example, there's probably not a lot of HD receivers out here. We've got one HD station that I'm aware of in the immediate vicinity now, which is one more than we had even six months ago. So it may change over time, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, very much just know your market and uh, figure out from there because HD does add cost, whether it's, now we can provide an analog box that'll handle HD in the medium power range without adding a lot of cost. And then you're going to pay it when you decide to upgrade. So, you know, it is very much figure out what you need to do. Uh, let's see. That's a good question here. Yes, I'm looking. Uh, lifetime of electrolytic caps for VS series for 75 degree temp. So nominal, and this is pretty consistent for any electrolytic, although the high temp rated ones like we use tend to be better. And I, I say I'm going to quantify like we use, like we use in most designs. I haven't opened up a VS to check. But uh, Typically, a cap is rated for a specific lifespan at uh, 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. And then for every 10 Celsius or 18 Fahrenheit, you decrease the temperature, you double that lifespan. So when you get down to 75 or about 22, 23, I guess 23, 24 Fahrenheit or Celsius rather, you're probably looking at nominal one and a half or two and a half times the uh, the default. So, and, and the other thing, this is something folks don't think about either, the orientation of the cap when it's mounted um, on an electrolytic, especially a high power electrolytic can make a difference. So estimates on lifetime, can't tell you. I mean, I've got ND series transmitters out there that were built in the 80s that are still running all all original caps. You know, so it's it, a lot of it is very, very, very site specific. Will they pass NRSC after that time period? They are. They are. So, yeah. Must be air, must be well air handled. Uh, again, I mean, it uh, it depends. Uh, we're putting on the ND series, we had 66,000 microfarads of capacitance on each power module. So, you know, there's a fair bit of capacitance. And the only thing the capacitors are doing is uh, smoothing the uh, the power supply. 
because it's uh, in those ones we used a uh, 12 pulse rectifier, so just a three phase uh, full wave rectifier. Um, there's no, well, there is PDM filtering, but in those we used a low pass filter and it's got plastic caps in it, not electrolytics. So we don't have the uh, the issues with PDM leakage that uh, that some have got with with that kind of uh, transmitter. Plus, again, you have stated your design criteria. Uh, I know, generally speaking, and this isn't their current box by any imagination. Gates one or a gates five, uh, after five or ten years, they start throwing spurs and. It's mm -hmm. very common to replace the electrolytics on those. Right. And again, I don't know enough about them to know how they do the modulation. So that's not something I'm qualified to talk to at all. But uh, but certainly, again, this comes down to knowing your specific transmitter and the things like the old Amphets used to get the, uh, the Cinch-Jones connectors that oxidized. And they'd start doing some really weird and intermittent stuff. And, and my uh, my troubleshooting tip for that was kick it. You know, you walk up to the transmitter, you give each rectifier a little nudge with your toe, and if it stables up and settles down and plays nice, then you know you need to clean the Jones plugs. So, again, learning the, the I guess, idiosyncrasies of your specific gear also has uh, a long way to go, especially when it starts to get a little longer in the tooth and start doing some of the weird stuff. Um, Elaine's asked, do supply chain issues in mind? Have you made any changes to recommended spare parts kits? Um, the only change I've made is that I tend to talk people out of them less than I used to. Um, my theory with manufacturer spares typically, and, and I put us in the same boat, uh, we have two levels of spares. We've got what we call site spares, which are fuses and uh, fans and, and things, consumables, the things you expect to fail. And then we've got the full site spares, which will have extra PAs or power supplies or uh, all the semiconductors in the high power stuff. It'll have the combining uh, uh, hybrid reject load resistors, things like that. So um, that's a lot of parts that are going to spend a lot of time sitting on the shelf. Um, for those, historically, I typically say, look, uh, get a couple of power supplies, a PA, Get the site kit where you got the fans and the fuses. Maybe buy a couple of these reject load resistors. You save yourself a thousand bucks, and you'll have uh, everything you need. More and more as we go into the supply chain stuff, I'm more inclined to somebody says, "I'd like to get the full site kit." It's like, absolutely, here you go, and then I'll just discount it to make it a little, uh, little less uh, squirmy inducing, if you will. I think again, it's going to be each transmitter even within a uh, manufacturer's line you need to know how it's operated for others and mm -hmm. it's good to talk about that in fact yep. again we invite people to to comment about their transmitters i i see jamie uh, wens mentions that they have a low power 100 watt using a crown fm 150 that's mm -hmm. 11 years old yep and and so other crown users would have a good place to tell what parts you need and how often you look at it, or someone with a Gates 5. or Yep, or if you got one of our older FM series, you can start to expect to see the fans go because those, and again, fans would be another prime example of something that's a, a, a known consumable. You know, it's moving parts, so you can expect it to fail at some point. And then the difference is how clean you keep it and how um, cool you keep it and how low you keep the back pressure. So if you've got a positively pressurized site with forced air, well filtered, those fans might still be kicking along 40, 50 years from, from the day you buy the transmitter. Whether yeah. the rest of the box is or not, I can't answer that. But, but the fans may not be the issue. If you've got a site that's a, a little bit cruddier and uh, negative pressure and there's a lot of back pressure, maybe you've got a duct on the roof with a where the fans are expected to force the air out and there's no exhaust fan, then those fans are going to die a whole lot faster. And, uh, you know, you can expect to see them crapping out in four or five years. So sort of like what, um, what uh, shoot, I'm brain farting here. 
Um, what Jeff was talking about with the VS two and a half PAs, um, fans are one of those things. If you see one fail, that's fine. It could be a one-off. If you see two fail, then it's time to start assuming that over the next little while, you're going to see more. So um, again, you can start budgeting your parts requirements based on your, your experience. There's another uh, piece, and it's a very inexpensive one, but very important. I'll get to that uh, because I told the story, I think, last week since you were last with us. And, uh, but if uh, there's anyone who has not a chance uh, to run the poll, uh, it's at the bottom of your screen. It says poll, and you can click on that and answer the questions. And I'll close that down in just a, a couple of minutes here. But uh, got a call from a station. They were... Uh, recovering from a power outage and they were running 105 watts out of two and a half kilowatts and the guy wanted to know what should he do and i said well press your raise button oh i'm busy i gotta go to a remote and it took me several days to find out that eventually he went back and pressed the raise button but mm -hmm. then another power flash and i got another call and they're down at 105 watts and i said well there's one answer it's not the raise button or the lower button. It's not the modules in the transmitter. You didn't replace the battery. Mm -hmm. And that applies to virtually every transmitter that's been made since we went solid state. Sort of, yes. Um, it will vary. Uh, like if you look at most of our older boxes, the battery was only used to hold the latch to keep the alarm lights lit. So when you got to the site, you'd know what happened. It uh, had absolutely no impact on the operational status of the transmitter because that was done with latching relays. Hmm. So, you know, in that case, batteries wouldn't do it. Um, there was another brand that uh, if your battery was dead and your power went out, you weren't coming back up when the lights came back on. So, yeah, absolutely. Batteries uh, batteries are something else to pay attention to. You need to, um, you know, and, and again, um, I don't know about everybody else. I can only speak for us. I know we monitor the uh, batteries and uh, there have been more than once where I've logged into a customer's transmitter and the only alarm on it is a low battery alarm. And it's like, you know, you're playing with fire here. So, uh, yeah, it, it's very much uh, something that uh, the that, that, uh, routine maintenance tasks will impact your life cycle planning a whole lot. Now, the, the challenge is that uh, the folks that don't have time to do the maintenance typically don't have time to do the life cycle planning either. <laughs> Ken's nodding his head there, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean that that's you know just speaking as the guy that takes the calls for the, all these years, the folks that are doing the maintenance on a regular and routine basis and calling me if anything's sideways or out of the ordinary are typically the ones that are replacing the stuff before the flames shoot out the top, and and they're doing it on a schedule. Now, even then, I mean, Thor can throw something at you and uh, totally readjust your schedule. Or, you know, I had one guy, he had a budgeted replacement for a transmitter, and he called me up uh, right at the end of the year, and he goes, yeah, we're going to have to move this out to next year because our audio console took a dump. And they ended up replacing, upgrading their entire studio facility, you know, a year or two ahead of plan. So... Priorities will change, but if you at least if you've got a plan, you can adjust it a whole lot easier than when you're just flying by the seat of your pants. And I mean, I'm the least organized guy on the planet, so I'm, it seems kind of hypocritical for me to be talking about this. Hello, Lark. Mark, Mark uh, Garrett over on YouTube is nodding his head in unison with the others. Uh, <laughs> agreement with what you're saying there jeff and it, it is important i mean you think about all the aspects and i'm sure if we were to ask you to to spend a little time and call your pictures you probably have seen some of the cleanest facilities that you could imagine the old phrase eating off the floor and you've probably seen some of the most incredibly garbagey dusty dirty, filter-encrusted 
how could that transfer oh. still be operating place? So, and, and Jeff Wilson can uh, vouch for this, but uh, shout out to Armando with Odyssey down in Dallas for having what may be the best AM site I've ever walked through. Um, we went through the, how long ago was that, Mr. Wilson? Uh, three, four years now? Yeah, something like that. He, he's going to leave, stay muted. But, uh, I mean, we walked through there and it was... I mean, I, you could eat off the floor in this AM facility. It, it was just such a labor of love. The the phaser, everything was spotless. Which and one I, was that? It, what, it was when the radio show was in uh, Dallas, 2019, I think. Yeah. What, what station was that? Do you remember? KRLD. Yeah. And I say just huge shout out. I mean, that site is, the, the, they've done an amazing job on that. And, and that's that, not to call they? out anybody else for anything else other than the one in Taiwan where I walked into and disconnected the uh, flange from the output of an FM10 and the transmitter fell over because the output cable was the only thing holding it vertical. Wow. Carol, did that, uh, they remodeled that, didn't they? It used to be a cathedral building. And... It's very much still a legacy looking site. It, it's really cool. And I mean, there there are still a few around. I know uh, I've run into a couple in the Midwest and a uh, few here and there. And I'm not going to yell out call signs for fear of screwing anything up because uh, as I get older, my memory gets a little weaker. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there there are some really, really nice sites out there and there are some really, really nasty ones out there. And I'd hate to say that uh, all the nasty ones are, I, I, I'd like to be able to say all the nasty ones were over overseas in, in you know, in uh, hidden away places. But uh, I've been to sites where they quite literally, I, I had a guy call me and he said, yeah, he goes, uh, I don't know why they didn't call you sooner, but he goes, I had to cut away three inches of uh, a three inch thick tree that was blocking me from opening the door. So you know how long does it take a tree to get a tree to get to be three inches thick? Good point. Good point. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing, and to an extent, consolidation has led to this. It's uh, no longer a situation where an engineer has one or two stations, and he can easily spend his time buffing the floors. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, making sure the filters are cleaned regularly or, or, or everything like that. Watch out for the, the uh, mice and, and other things. Right. And but, I mean, some of it's got to go back to the owners, too, because in some <clears throat> cases they will tell a guy you're specifically coming in, contract guy or whatever, you're coming in to fix this. Don't do anything else. Not paying you to clean the floors or whatever. Jeff, thanks for that picture. Uh, that's an interesting site because... At least when I was there, they were using a, a pair of dishes back to back at the bottom of the tower for the STL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gap. seen that more than once where they'll have a dish at the top um, picking up a signal and a dish at the bottom sending it into the building. And uh, I mean, you, perfect Nothing air wrong. gap. You don't, don't need any opto isolators or anything like yep. that. Nothing wrong with that. Nope, nope. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, these days, especially when you're getting into like the, the nano beams and the, the little Wi-Fi bridges, I mean, you slap one of those together for a nickel 95, yep. you know, so relative to an ISO coil or whatever, why the heck not? That's good. Jeff, looks like he put up the KRLD picture. Yep. That is a cool old site. It is, it yeah. Is. Uh, uh, and like I say, it's uh, it, it's always nice to walk into one like that. And I mean, I've again, I've walked into a few uh, certain guys sitting in front of a train engine up there had a really, really nice site in a high rise in Chicago that I got to see one day. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Carter, when we uh, put the NV40 in for FMT. Um, that was also the site where I discovered that dynamic range and classical music can really uh, give you a surprise if you're tooling down I-94 and you think the station went off the air, so you crank the audio up to hear the little tiny flute thing in the background right before the cannon crescendo blows you over three lanes of traffic. But uh, 
but yeah, no, Gordon, Gordon had that site. Just, uh, that, that was again, one of these ones where, you know, high rise building, not just a transmitter out in the field. So that, that was all, all the different experiences. I can't take credit for that. I, I got to give credit where it's due. And, um, I got to say that, um, uh, Tommy Wilson and his predecessors at uh, Channel 11, who really were in charge of that site, did a much, uh, I mean, they, like you say, they, they took pride in their work and uh, also in the place where they had to spend a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it, it's always much more pleasant if you've got a nice place to work. And and that's the the key thing, and and that's I think one of the situations where and and again coming back, like I say, the contract guys. I mean, nothing against the contract guys, but they're in the route that's they don't spend every day there, and they're typically getting paid specifically to do this or that or the other thing. So, I mean, most of them tidy up behind themselves, but yeah, there's not a lot of time left to, uh, to do the stuff that uh, a dedicated uh, station engineer will do sometimes. And, uh, you know, it, it varies very much. I mean, I, you know, I certainly don't want to try and qualify one to another. I mean, I see uh, Dave Doherty over in the corner and I've seen Dave cleaning up behind himself after sites here and there. And, uh, you know, and, and several others that I can see on the list here. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the experiences are as varied as the number of people there are doing this stuff. And there's a lot of this. But uh, ultimately, if you don't know what you got, and, and yeah, I'm beating the drum on having an inventory again, but, uh, but you need an asset list. You need that more than anything, because from there you can sort of get, well, how long should this live? And, uh, you know, for little things like headphones, I mean, shoot, headphones, <laughs> dependent on the jocks they could live hours instead of years <laughs> but uh but you know i mean stuff like that i wouldn't worry so much about but when you get up into the four digits and higher for replacement costs at that point you want to start factoring in life cycles and uh how long it should live and reach out to the manufacturers and say hey you know what's expected lifespan of this and I mean, usually you call us, we're going to give you some flippant, I don't know, the first one we built still in service. But even with that said, we do have a specific design life cycle. And I mean, theoretically, these days, their engineering is told that uh, they there should be designing for stuff to be supportable 15 years after we stop building. So there, there's your in, reference. <laughs> yep, yep. Before we go any further, I'll mention next week, we're going to talk... Uh, Actually, the rest of the month, we're going to talk IT largely, firewalls uh, and such. And I hope to have a couple of firewalls to demonstrate live mm -hmm. uh, next week. So just let everybody know that. Any, anyone have a question for, uh, for, for Jeff or uh, for Jeff? No, I have an observation. Good. Um, you know, one of the things that um, is happening as, as many of us approach and reach retirement um, is that uh, these transmitters that we've all been maintaining uh, are not going to have anybody to maintain them anymore. Yep. And uh, the, the pitch at this point should be to management. Look, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. You got to have something reliable. When that thing blows up on top of the mountain, who are you going to call? You know? And I think that is as much as, as, um, the cost analysis, the cost benefit analysis, life cycle cost analysis, whatever, however you want to put it, uh, is is every bit as important. Um, you know, because the transmitter that you buy from uh, from Jeff, uh, Jeff or Jeff, um, will be uh, you know that'll be good for 15, 20 years if it's if it's in a decent environment. Um, I'm not going to be good for 15, 20 years. Um, you know. Pretty sure I won't be. <laughs> Not working anyway. A I, lot had of the a IT guys, I had a Doherty that lasted that long, Dave. And a lot of the IT guys this. wouldn't know what to do. Well, and that's a whole different discussion. And that's something that I've been, I, I, I don't say tasked with, I've volunteered myself. Uh, it, it's like everything else. You know, you go to a meeting, you put up your hand, it immediately becomes your project. 
Um, but we're working a lot with the SBE about seeing what we can do to put a couple of programs together to try and sort of teach the RF basics because that's the stuff. I mean, the, the new kids, they're pretty good on the IT, probably a lot better than I am, most of them. But, uh, and of course, that's not saying much. I mean, me and IT have a uh, uh, let's see what this button does relationship. But, uh, but the, um, the, yeah, the RF is the stuff. And I mean, Mark Persons and I have had several discussions about, you know, how, how do we teach them Ohm's law and how to read a schematic? I mean, they, they can read a, uh, a network flow chart. So, you know, the only difference is the components you're drawing. I think we're, we're getting into a time where, um, that kind of basic knowledge and, you know, maybe blasphemy here, uh, isn't as much required as it used to be, because I think that we're getting into a point where, um, the, the way to maintain a transmitter is to keep spares, spare modules on hand. And when a module blows up, replace it and send the mm -hmm. module out for repair. Um, yeah, it's getting like that. And it, that's and one it, of those people. More and more. Yeah. And, and people talk about, they're like, yeah, you guys started building this and then we had to lose our engineers. And it's like, no, we started building it because, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and, and I mean, it, it's one of those shoot uh 2001 no 2011 john Poré did the the presentation about the aging out of the industry the graying of the industry and 2021 the only thing that's changed is we've gotten older so and, and now all of a sudden the managers the station owners are coming to us and they're going do you know anybody can fix this because we're off the air and it's like yeah well there are two contract engineers within 500 miles of you, and both of them are up to their ears right now. So, you know, buckle up. Yeah. I remember, and I've told this story a few times as well, uh, attending the Nautel users group. And I don't know if it was you or, or uh, one of the other guys said, uh, how many in this room are under the age of 50? And in a room of 350 people, that would have been me. <laughs> you, you could count the, hand, the the fingers on one hand. Yeah, yeah, not not quite, but almost. Uh, Steve mentions a good one here. Thanks, uh, Steve, for mentioning that the SBE's mentor program too. Um, if you're not on it, you should be. If you think that, well, and, and I'll, I'll give myself as a prime example. Um, historically, I have not been on the mentor program because I know transmitters really well, and I know everything after the STL pretty well. But all that stuff that happens in the studio, that's magic to me, um, you know, because it's not something I've got any experience. So now the mentor program has added what they call a subject matter expert category. So you can volunteer to um, mentor in specific areas. You know, there may be so if there's something that you're strong in, by all means, uh, you know, reach out and uh, hook yourself up with that because, there's, you know, there's I also mean, a series at uh, Alabama and Birmingham. Uh, Larry's uh, okay. Alabama Engineering Academy, the ABA, yep. Um, WBA in their summer conference in June does, uh, Terry Bond had started at the Media Training Institute. Uh, and uh, Bill, was, uh, been, Bill Hubbard has been working at keeping that going. So, uh, and I, I get to play with that a little bit. So I've got some experience. And Steve, so, Steve yeah. Brown. Yep, exactly. So there, there's several of them out there. Um, I had done one or two uh, regional, just uh, one day engineering conferences where we bring a bunch of vendors in and try to cover everything from the mic to the antenna in a day. And uh, I think you'll be seeing a few more of those. So, you know, SBE does their NS sessions, which are a little more geared toward engineers that know what's up, but uh, but again, you're going to see more things like that happening, and hopefully we're not too late. Yeah. Jerry uh, mentions that uh, here's another thing to plan ahead for if you have a Telos uh, QRA, uh, QOR engine. Uh, something about the uh, cracks. Mm-hmm. Yep, and, and main boards, that'd be another example. Board, uh, this is something folks don't think about, but all this talk about supply chain, and we talk about the components being hard to get and uh, logistics and getting things from over here to over there. 
And uh, what nobody has talked about a whole lot is that uh, even the, the circuit board substrates, just the, the blank boards, um, it, it's those things are getting harder and harder to find. I mean, and, our, and not only that, uh, uh, Mike Langner from Albuquerque uh, phoned me and uh, their station is looking for the 4CX 12,000 A. Can't find mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. not, not for rebuilding, not for using, nothing. Right. Yep. And that's going to be, you know, that that's not going to change anytime soon. And I mean, like everybody's, oh, the supply chain will be better by 2023. I'm pretty sure this is 2023, and I'm here to tell you it's not better. Um, and I have always said that I figure it'll be mid to late 2024 before we see any significant improvement, if then. So, uh, yeah, that, that's why conversations like this one are so critical, because this is something historically we've never really had to mess with. If you called me up 10 years ago and said, hey, we're off the air, I need a new transmitter, how fast can you get me one? Well, what do you need? Okay, I'll rob that from this guy, call this guy, say, hey, can you wait two more weeks? That's how long it'll take us to build one from scratch, and we'll have one out to you in three days. And that's just not an issue anymore. I mean, the backlog of stuff orders we've got waiting to be built is at unprecedented levels. And I mean, part of that's because we're, we're busy and that's better than being bored. But part of it's just because for every part that we source, five more will come in that they'll say, yeah, no, you remember that part we told you you'd had next week? It's going to be another month. So, uh, yep, ongoing challenge. And by all means, the more that you've got figured out as far as uh, you know what you replace when the better the odds of us not having the off the air discussion sure if we're moving into the studio uh, chris hayes mentions uh, spills into a console you trash a card and try to find one they try to find something for a logitech console about 12 14 years old and you can't you you can't get it at any price so uh, that's that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's where spares come in comes into play. Really important these days. Yeah. Like it's it's a lot of products. It's not just consoles and transmitters. It's headphones and uh, UPSs, and uh, oh. it's it's all across the board. There was a discussion on one of the forums within the past week or so somebody had ordered a january a generator in february 2022 told they'd get it in june or july june or july rolled around they were told it'd be november november rolled around they were told february 2023 um, last week they were told maybe not so now they're over a year later you know and, and still no generator so yeah it's it's i've got another friend who's had a car sitting Un, not dysfunctional, not working in his driveway for the better part of a month, waiting on a part to come in. And it's sitting in his driveway because there's no place to park it at the repair center because they're full of cars waiting for parts. One of uh, my mechanic friends tells me, if you're going to buy a vehicle, don't buy anything after 2017 at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Because if you have something Later than that, either it was thrown together in the last year or so because trying to yeah. make substitutions, or if a part does go bad, you're not going to find one. Yeah, and that ties into what Ray's mentioned with the medical electronics where they can't sub-components like, like we do in broadcast. And, and, and that, again, I mean, we've, I saw one of our competitors posted, hey, yeah, we're still able to sell stuff or ship stuff in, in pretty short notice. We're able to sub out the stuff we can't get. And then I'm talking to one of our other competitors, and they're like, yeah, we're having to resort to the black market for some stuff. And we resist that. We, I'd rather give you a longer delivery than sub out a part that I may not be able to get next week or order a black market part and discover they're all counterfeit after they blow up in your, uh, in your site. So, yeah, it, it's, I mean, we're all making judgment calls different ways in order to, uh, to keep, keep things going. And uh, okay. it's definitely an interesting time. And one other thing, uh, you used to find substitution guides for almost everything. Mm -hmm. And you can't find them anymore. Well, so I remember the old Even ECG if you want to substitute, you can't. Yep. 
or if you can, it takes a lot of research. Well, and that's it. I mean, I just had this conversation with somebody not too long ago about uh, they were looking for a fan and I downloaded the manual they were talking about and found the fan and then got on uh, Mauser, I think it was, and started looking for versions similar. And and that's, yeah, it, it, there, there's a lot of research for sure. If a company doesn't sell 100 million items these days, they take it offline. It gets to be, I mean, obviously the quantity will vary depending on the company, but yeah. And the other challenge is, uh, so broadcast typically is what you would call a niche market. I mean, we, uh, you know, we, we use specific parts, but we don't use huge quantities of them. So like you take power supplies. I mean, the power supplies we use in just about everything these days, we order them a thousand at a time. And, you know, to us, that's a pretty big number. But when you've got a uh, aeronautics company ordering them 50,000 at a time, it's real easy for our order to get kicked to the back of the line. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very much a, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting times, to put it uh, gently. Well, any other questions for Jeff? We've uh, hit the top of the hour, and uh, Jeff is uh, out there in the Atlantic time zone somewhere, so he's itching to get his day done. But... Oh, look, I am two, the, the way my day's gone, I'm two steps away from pouring in a little wee dram of single malt and uh, sitting down with the wife and uh, talking about her day. Was Eric Deason the chief engineer at KRLD when you were over there? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we were working with the transmitter guy, primarily Armando, and I don't remember who all was there. That'd be a Jeff Wilson question. Yeah, Not my I, territory. I'm pretty sure uh, Mr. Deason is no longer there. That was, uh, I, I'm, I, and that Armando is the market chief. Thank you. Ar Armando is an excellent engineer to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what I say, just finding the guys that are uh, that are enthusiastic and uh, putting the effort in. I mean, it's so cool. And there are a few of them. Um, uh, you know, I, I see, uh, I saw the, um, was it uh, RBR uh, top, uh, what is it, their top 20 industry movers and shakers list came out. And it's always cool to see engineering folks uh, represented there. Well, somebody should invite them to join us here. <laughs> yeah you are going to see uh, so fiona came to me earlier and said hey how come you don't tell me about this and i said bill because your boss volunteered me for it i just assumed you knew but <laughs> uh, so you'll, you'll see us uh publicizing a little more in uh, our media over the next few uh next little while great uh mentioning john um uh, john white hmm we just he just exchanged emails with me and renewed for this whole year and i i'm i i feel the need to tell this it's a very short thing when i started the bdr i got a phone call from john and his question was how can we help he was the first one to support the bdr and they've been there all along no tell and I'm grateful for it. And that, that's why y'all are stuck with me now. So I posted a picture on Facebook the other day of uh, I was on a lengthy phone call and one of my dogs fell asleep on my legs. So, you know, I uh, automatically anybody who nods off while I'm talking is forgiven. As long as it's a dog, right? Well, you know, dogs get a lot more uh, leeway as a rule, but yeah oh, it's uh, interesting pup. yeah go ahead go ahead jeff no no i, I was just oh, going to say oh. yep yeah, just I, the dogs I, dogs get a lot of slack i was just going to jump in and say not only are they stuck with you but it seems to be that you're multiplying <laughs> <laughs> more, more jeff w's coming from Nottel. well our, our running joke has been if uh ted ever decides to retire on the east coast we're going to have to grab jeff williams away from yellow tech and then uh if you ever call for anything in north america it'll be uh, just give it to jeff that works. Very good. 
All right. On that note, I am going to disappear. So, folks, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Have a wonderful week, everybody.